Hello, cadets. I am Major Thevenin, and we will be going over Chapter 7 in your EMR book, Airway Management. In this chapter, we are going to learn some anatomy, physiology of the respiratory system, and also what to do while, while awaiting a EMS or paramedics. Airway management, like we said, important to know the anatomy, how to assess if something's wrong with the patient's airway that you're taking care of. Um, again, we're gonna go again briefly about the over, going over the respiratory system. So physiology and path pathophysiology, meaning what can be go what can go wrong doing respiration, and we know respiration is there's two functions is to ventilate and is to ox oxygenate, and we're gonna go further to see what those mean. Okay. For respiration, you know it's what your lungs do providing oxygen uh, to the body. Uh, artificial ventilation means when the person's body no longer is able to provide oxygen or ventilation to the body. So now we, as the medical provider, either in the field or in the hospital, we breathe for them. So this is called the artificial ventilation. So as the EMR, we need to see and manage life-threatened issues based on a patient's emergency. We're going to see the respiratory system have an upper airway and a lower airway. So let's, come, let's start. So introduction, right? So two most important life-saving skills is how to, the airway care and the rescue breathing. It's very important that we remember your ABCs. Once you see a per person down, you need to make sure, are they, are they, is the airway open? Is there something stuck in their airway or not? Is the patient breathing? Do you see chest rise? And if the heart is beating, do you feel pulse? So to maintain life, all human must have food, water, and oxygen. And we know we can last for a few days without food. A um, couple of we can last the longest without food. A uh, couple of days without water, but very few seconds without oxygen before anything. The keyword irreversible happens in terms of uh, there's two organs that are very sensitive to oxygen. It's your brain and also it's your heart so that is a purpose why we need to make sure in every situation you make sure that person is breathing and the airway is open okay so the main purpose of respiratory system is to provide oxygen and to remove carbon dioxide from the red blood cells so carbon dioxide is a waste that the body produces and uh, the lung that's where the lung exchange takes place. You breathe in oxygen and you breathe out carbon dioxide. So this is the uh, <coughs> respiratory system. Okay, and two lungs on both sides of the chest. You have the, uh, you can breathe through your nose or through your mouth. And it goes back to the, the larynx and the pharynx, the trachea. And the, the trachea into your chest area breaks into your bronchus. You have, this is the left side, this is the right side. So you would have a right bronchus, a left bronchus, and a, and a left bronchus. And this is a picture of when you zoom in where the exchange takes place in terms of oxygen 
in the red capillaries and low oxygen flow in the blue capillaries, okay? In an unconscious patient lying in it on their back, the passage of air through both nose and mouth may be blocked by tongue. So, as you lay back, you can see the tongue, gravity just brings the tongue down and you can see how it blocks the airway. So air that's trying to come through cannot pass into the lower air, the airway up here. And as you breathe in, the airway stops there. All right, so very important that we keep that one thing that can block an airway is your tongue. Other things that can block airway is vomiting. If the patient is vomiting, guess what? We have fluid, we have food that's backing up, and air cannot pass to the trachea. So the other part of the, um, there's two passages, right? We spoke about the esophagus. Um, sorry. So we know about the trachea. So um, let's see if we can see this. We see this dangling thing right there. This is called the epiglottis. It is what it's, that's what protects as you eat. How do we know when we eat, we awake, when we eat and swallow, nothing goes in the back, nothing goes into the trachea. It's because this floppy thing here, the epiglottis, as the mechanism, God is so good that the mechanism, as you swallow, this comes down and blocks the airway. So it blocks fluid, it blocks food, it blocks mucuses from going into our airway. And we remember the, the airway is divided into the bronchi. So let me go back. I'm going to see if I can go back. So we have one trachea and two bronchi, which is the left bronchus and the right bronchus. So plural bronchi. And uh, I'm going to show you in the next picture. The smaller airway is called the bronchioles. All right, we have many bronchioles. And in the bronchioles, that's where there are tiny air sacs called alveoli. And the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide happens in the alveoli. Okay? So this is the alveoli. This is the one of the bronchi one of the bronchioles and the bronchioles breaks into alveoli and this is where you see the small blood vessels uh, oxygen oxygen rich vessels and right here low oxygen vessels uh, alveoli that's where the exchange happens so in this picture the arrow shows that we are breathing. So as you breathe out, as you breathe out, everybody try it. When you breathe, when you breathe in, your lung, you feel like your chest opens up, right? And as you breathe in, as you breathe out, your chest closes in. And that's what respiration is about. So on exhalation, the diaphragm relaxes and once again becomes dome shaped. You see that? It relaxes and it's dome shaped. Okay? And this is a diaphragm. This is a muscle, again, that protects the lung, the chest area, and then the belly area. In between is a diaphragm. So diaphragm also contracts and relax, relaxes during breathing. A for airway. 
In healthy individuals, the airway is stays open. In an injured, in a serious ill person that you may encounter, there's a potential that the airway will be blocked because, again, the lung, I mean the tongue, gets in the way because you cannot control it. It's a muscle that just flaps. So you must take step to understand when the airway is an issue and know how to correct it. So first thing is you pat the person, are you okay? Can you hear me? If you get a response, yeah, I'm okay. Or what's your name? Bob, guess what? Then the, if they answer, the airway is intact. If there's no response, you know, you need to repeat the question. Again, if there's still no response, I would do this two times. Okay, maybe a bit louder, a little bit more vigorous um, stimulus to wake them up and see what's going on. But if there's no response, you move to the next step. If the patient is responsive, you call 911 immediately or call for help or call get somebody to call 911. Then position the patient by supporting the head and back and placing the patient on his or her back. Quickly, you look for I hope you look for if the patient is breathing, meaning you see if there's any ch uh, chest rise and if there's circulation, meaning you check the carotid right here you see this person right there what they're doing is called the head tilt chin lift that mech that movement should increase the opening of the airway as you move up your jaw it moves up the muscle in the back of your throat as well as your as as well as your tongue out the way so to open that airway back there you can read the rest of the slide yourself. The other way is a jaw thrust maneuver. See the whole, this person is take, touching, holding the head, meaning so they keep the neck kind of stable as much as possible. But if you're not worrying about neck issues, you will tilt the head back as if they're sniffing up in the air and you'll tilt the chin up. Now, if you suspect there's an injury to the neck, you know, somebody say, hey, this person fell, so you know you're high risk of, uh, you got to think of trauma. So what do you do? What do you do? In the next picture, we're going to see, you can do a draw thrust maneuver. Again, place the patient on, her back, on their back straight. Place your hand behind the angle of the jaw without moving the neck you just move your hand upward in this direction. Up like this. This opens the airway without moving much of the neck called the C-spine, you know, cervical spine. The next thing is we need to think of what can be blocked, what, can, what is blocking the airway. Can this be vomiting? Can this be mucus or blood? Uh, is it a piece of candy, some kind of foreign body or food? Dirt, sometimes teeth too, can be a cause of blockage. If you see something in the patient's mouth, you remove it. If you do not see anything, do not go digging in there. So we call this a finger sweep. Um, it's, this can be done quickly. All you need is a, is our gloves. Okay. There's suctioning materials that you might have in your kit to suction. The suction is fluid, mucus, blood, liquid. Okay. So look for that and put that in your kit. There are um, suction devices that EMS or paramedics walk around with. All right, these come with a uh, force. So there's a bit more force compared to this, which is a, a bulb pump. 
versus this machine, okay? So a lot of EMS or paramedics have those. All right, these are called the mechanical suction devices. So how do you maintain an airway? For unconscious patients, continue holding the head and maintain the head tilt chin or the draw thrust, okay? If the patient is breathing after this movement, if the patient is the patient is breathing and a bit responsive, and there is no help that has arrived, you may place them in a recovery position. That will allow the airway to maintain to remain open. And we'll see in the next slide. <clears throat> what uh, how's that position? So this is a position. One leg extended, the other folded. The, the chest is kind of leaning forward, so any vomiting, any blood, any secretion will be flowing out into the floor, not in the back of the throat. And due to gravity, the tongue will be sliding forward away from the back of the airway. So there's other ways, there's other things that we're going to see and play with in class, how to use and how and the purpose of them, okay? There's primary two, let's see. All right, so um, this is called a oral airway. If you happen to see a person that is unconscious, but they are breathing, or respiratory arrest, meaning they're not breathing, and do not have a gag reflex. How do you check your gag? If you take one finger and put it in, put it as far back in your throat, you're gonna see it's gonna start gagging. That's it. That is a protective reflex that God has created in us. That if anything gets in the back abnormally, that doesn't belong there, our body automatically gags to prevent it from going to the wrong air to the to the airway. All right, try it. You'll see. Now you will always remember what is a gag reflex. So, like we said, this is an oral airway. There, it comes in different sizes. There's plastic. There's soft plastic. Uh, I think this is a little bit softer plastic. This is a harder plastic. Um, and this allows the patient airway to open. So you see this little curved part there? The aim is to put this in the back of the throat. And this is the shape of the tongue. So it will push the tongue out the way and allow the airway to remain open until further help arrives. So very important that you select the size. And we're going to show you in our drill next class how to make sure that we have the right size for the right person. All right. Um, there is a nasal airway. Nasal means nose. So this is a bit more softer and uh, flexible, malleable. And we put that in one of the nostrils, in one of the noses. And we put it till it reaches here, the tip will be at the end of your uh, one of your nose uh, nostrils and again this allows a clearer path for the air to go into your lungs this is this bypasses gag reflex because it does not go in the, in your th in through your mouth it can be used for unconscious and conscious patients Again, proper size is very important, and we're going to learn how to measure it from the tip of the earlobe to the nose. Uh, this one, you need to have lube, lubricant, so it can pass through the narrow parts of the nose. So B, B is for breathing. How do you breathe for a patient, and how, access to, how do you access for breathing? You got to look, listen, and feel. Look to see... If there's chest rise, listen to see if you hear air movement in the lung and feel also 
across, you put your hand across the mouth and nose to see if you feel air hitting it. These are quick way. This should be 10, 5 to 10 seconds. These are, there, are num there are numbers that you need to memorize. A normal breathing rate for an adult is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. For a child, for babies, child, uh, this number goes up because <clears throat> they are, airway is tinier, body is tinier, and they need, uh, they need fast, they breathe faster. We need to learn what's normal breathing and abnormal breathing. So normal breathing is what you're doing right now. Inadequate breathing is noisy respiration. It's not noisy, right? You see you're wheezing. That's wheezing, gurgling. All right, that's kind of gurgling. Is, a, is breathing rapid? You know, do they look like they're gasping for air? And are their skin pale or blue? You know, when it's pale or blue, that means there's no there's lack of oxygen going through through the vessels, through the muscle. I mean, through the um, skin. The most critical sign is respiratory arrest, which is char characterized by lack of chest moving movement, lack of breath sounds, lack of air against the side of your face. Okay, this is what we call respiratory arrest. The heart is beating, but they are not breathing. What can cause respiratory arrest? This is a short list, but a lot of things. Heart, heart, heart attacks, something blocking the airway, such as the tongue, vomiting, foreign object, you know, kids can choke. Um, choking, the, choking is a cause of adequate, inadequate breathing. Diseases, some air, like COPD or asthma. Uh, again, it's a lot of medical problems that can cause these things. Uh, drug overdose, you know, we, we have the um, opiates that slows down your breathing to the point that you stop breathing, so that can be a cause. Poisoning, uh, Lord, severe blood loss can cause uh, re respiratory arrest. Even electrocution, like I said, this is not a complete list. Assess for any motionless patient. Are they moving? Are they responding? Any signs of breathing? If the patient is unresponsive, meaning they're not conscious, scan for the chest. You know, that's something that you always have to put, it has to be second nature for you, your ABCs. As you perform rescue breathing, keep patient airway open. And we're going to see different devices to keep the airway open and how to breathe for them while help is on the way. Um... If you know your patient and you do not mind mouth to mouth, go ahead and perform mouth to mouth. If you don't know the patient, I would advise not to use mouth to mouth. Okay, so please read through this slide. Next one. So there are mouth to mask rescue breathing. Again, this is a rescue breathing apparatus I would recommend to have in your kit. Ena this enables you, again, it protects you from mouth to mouth. It reduces you getting an infectious disease because you might not know the person. Okay. And we're going to show you how to properly place it. There are mouth to mouth rescue, mouth to mouth to barrier rescue. Devices are small enough to carry in your pocket. It can be like a pl plastic covering or something. Um... It has a port, has a hole that you breathe into and breathe for the patient. Again, uh, it decreases the chance of infection control, but this is the safest one because there's a valve that prevents anything from backing up into your system. Mouth to mouth breathing, again, no equipment is necessary. You would pinch the nose. You'll tilt, you see how they're in the sniffing position? You tilt the head, 
and you would make sure your mouth is sealed around theirs and you breathe and you breathe for how long what does that say here you breathe you give do them you give them two breaths breathe once into the mouth every five to six seconds this is as long as the heart is breathing if the heart this, if the heart is not beating this <clears throat> this uh changes but it's, if it's only respiratory arrest respiratory arrest first two breaths and then breathe every five to six seconds okay bag mask bag vav, valve mask this is this scenario it's definitely help if you have a second person to seal the mouth uh seal the mask over their face and another person pump um uh, inflating and deflating the mask The best way, again, is two-person operation. Well, oh, this is just a review, again. Are you okay? If, not un if they're unresponsive, activate EMS, call 911. Patient on their back, scan to see if they're breathing, check for a pulse, this is, takes five to 10 seconds. If there's a pulse, that means they're only in resp respiratory arrest. Look for the airway to see if there's anything blocking. Make sure you have gloves on. If there's something blocking and you see it, remove it. If you don't, the next step. The next step is you can add an oral, oral airway or a nasal airway. Um, and we can utilize the the mouth to mouth, mouth to barrier, or the bag valve mask breathing. Okay? Children, children are smaller and you will not have to use as much force to open the airway until they neck, correct? Give one rescue breath every three to five seconds. You see how this number changes? Adults. It's longer for kids. You remember how they breathe faster? So you need to breathe faster for them as well. So run rescue breath every three, three to five seconds. And the infant is even tinier. So be extremely gentle. You don't want to cause too much. You don't want to cause any further harm to their lungs when you breathe for them. The most common airway obstruction is the tongue. Food is the most common foreign object that causes airway obstruction, okay? So, tongue, already, we already have. That's the most common within us. From the outside source, the most common is food. Okay. As you can see, you see how the, uh, the food or whatever it is causes an obstruction there? And the tongue swelling also causes obstruction because as the as your throat swells up or your neck swells up it starts pushing 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 until the airway is blocked yep injury also can cause airway obstruction Mild airway obstruction, patient can cough in gags. If they're coughing, the airway is not blocked yet. Or the patient is able to speak, but a little bit difficulty. You know, the airway is, is in danger, but not, not closed up or blocked yet. Okay? So I see this person is coughing. Encourage them to cough. To bring to expel the object out. If, the, if there is no breathe, there's, if there, there's no airway, the person won't be able to speak because you need open airway for speech to happen. This person 
If this happens continuously, they will lose conscious within minutes. And we need to, a lot of us hopefully are CPR certified and we know how to do abdominal thrusts and also chest thrusts in a choking infant, child, adult. For airway and obstruction in child, you want to tilt the head back in neutral position. If the child becomes unresponsive, okay, re always remember, you do abdominal thrust or back thrust or chest thrust until the patient has expelled the foreign object and is breathing or they has become unresponsive. If they're unresponsive, that's when things change and we need to start performing CPR. All right. If the patient is, if an infant is crying, you hear the cry, the airway is not completely obstructed. Again, the keyword, unresponsive. If they have become unresponsive, they're no longer conscious, things change and we need to begin CPR. There's oxygen equipment that, um, you just need to know about um, that will deliver oxygen to to your patient the oxygen that's where you control the valve you can pre you can deliver two liters of oxygen per minute versus 15 liter max okay There's different, there's different um, devices. We're gonna see how EMS par paramedics um, provide oxygen. You have the nasal cannula, we have a face mask, and we have a non rebreather. All right. Every time you see this oxygen tank around. Make sure no one is smoking around around you because this is oxygen that will turn any that turn can blow up. So you gotta be careful when using the um, the oxygen tank. We would we don't want to be dropping it around again because this is pressured oxygen. If it explodes. It's bad news for everyone around. So please feel free to read, pause if you need to read the slide. So let's do this. Let's know what a nasal, nasal cannula. This right here connects into your oxygen tank or oxygen giving the device. This, you see two little nostril tips there, this goes inside your nose and it delivers one to six liters per minute of oxygen. And the oxygen is only 24 to 44% oxygen. As you sit here, you're breathing 21% of oxygen. So this nas nasal cannula only delivers 24% to 44%. Not much, but it's helpful. A non rebreather you have a bag there, and you have the face. This is the nose tip, this is the chin, this goes around the person's face, and this delivers eight to 15 liters of oxygen per minute. And because of the bag there and the reservoir, it delivers 90% of oxygen. Remember, as you breathe normal with nothing around you, you're 21% oxygen, and this delivers 90% of oxygen. A non rebreather should be used for patients who require higher flow of oxygen. You know, if they're short of breath, it's like, I can't breathe. If they're having chest pain, if you think they were in a fire area there, if they have heart problems, if there's signs of shock, which we'll know, we'll teach you what shock is, you know, you want to give them some oxygen until further help arrives. <clears throat>
pulse ox. Very important to have also in your kid. This quickly tells you how much oxygen the person is having. Anything, a normal oxygen, a normal healthy lung sitting down somewhere, anywhere, should be 99% to 100%. Okay, this what if you put it in your in your finger, this number should read 99 to 100%. If there is lack of ventilation in the lung, there's obstruction somewhere in the lung, this number goes down. And you typically put oxygen on some somebody if that number reads 94 or below. Okay? And also how the patient looks. You said? In a healthy patient, 95 to 100. I, my parameters are much higher. The pulse oximeter cannot tell you what's wrong with the patient. It just tells you, hey, it's slow, give them some oxygen. How much is something you will you'll have to determine how they look, what's the clinical presentation, what the patient, what the person look like. A pulse oximeter has certain limitations. You can have false reading if the patient has nail polish, long finger, dirty nails. Uh, thick skin, uh, if there's a lot, if there's a loss of blood flow, uh, if they're cold, if the fingers, extremities are cold, if there's presence of carbon monoxide, it can give you false reading. Remember that. So there is no machine that can replace what you see, your assessment, your history, and the physical that you do for the patient. Okay? What is a stoma? A stoma is basically, um, you see that the base of your neck, that little dimple there in the bottom of your neck? Some people have tracheas, meaning they, they, they're made of the surgeons. There's some reason, some reason that the airway was had an issue and they, they need a device through the neck to breathe. All right. If the patient has that, you have to make sure it's clean to keep the neck straight. Examine to make sure there's no mucus that needs to be suctioned in order for them to breathe. You can um, <clears throat> again the stoma can be that hole through the neck is a. Do we need to keep it open? Make sure there's no obstruction and deliver oxygen through it if we need to. Some complication of breathing for the patient. Again, you remember the tongue, the back of the the back of the airway was also connected to the esophagus, which is the um, the start of the the abdomen. All right. So as you breathe, put oxygen through the mouth. Automatically, some air can f go into the stomach and causes the belly to be expand to expand or distend. All right. When there's a massive amount of air in the in the stomach, there's a risk for vomiting. So something we need to take uh, remember. That's why we don't do we don't do too do we. We're not so crazy pushing air, pushing air, pushing air into the patient's airway because these are complications that we do not want. So breathe slowly into the patient's mouth just enough to make the chest rise. Okay, that's why it's very important that we, <clears throat> uh, we breathe uh, slowly for them. If the patient has dentures and they do not remove it, that allows a better seal for your face mask to be put. If you see a loose dental, partial dentures may become dislodged so they can become a, a, a hazard for the airway and you may remove it. Mm. Now, if you're in a vehicle, the draw thrust maneuver, 
This is important because if they're in a vehicle, the most likely there's some kind of trauma. So the draw thrust is important to make sure to make sure that the head and the spine does not become any further injured by you moving them. <clears throat> I think there's a picture. We'll see if there's a picture there. You wanna grab you wanna you wanna grab your hand in the back and the front, protecting the again the C spine and opening the airway. So when they're leaning forward like this, try to lean forward. And you can see how it might be a little more difficult because your your whole airway is is smaller compared to open sniffing position or straight ahead. The airway is much more open. Okay? You do not have to enter the the car itself to help the person out. You can easily monitor the patient's carotid pulse from the outside and breathe pa breathing pattern by using your fingers. The technique is to stabilize the patient's cervical spine and it opens the patient's airway. So to summarize, the main purpose of respiratory system is to provide oxygen and to remove carbon dioxide. When you think patients respiratory arrest, but they have a, you check for their responsiveness at least twice. Uh, open the block airway using the head tilt chin lift, or if you think there's a, there's a neck trauma, you do the jaw, the jaw thrust. Check for fluids, solids, dentures in the mouth. If you see something, remove it. If you don't, don't remove it. Uh, suction, if you see anything. If you can apply the different airway devices to keep it open until further help arrives. If they are improving, put them in the recovery position to prevent anything going back further into the neck or into the airway. Practice and know your position for your Heimlich maneuvers, which includes abdominal thrusts, chest thrusts, or back thrusts. Administering supplemental oxygen. Know your different ways to give oxygen and how much oxygen is needed. I would recommend having a pulse ox in your kit to see how what's the level of oxygen. Remember, uh, in the red blood cell. All right, so let's see some questions here. After opening the airway of a patient who has a pulse but is unconscious, you should what? Keyword, they have a pulse, they're unconscious. What do you do? Check for secretion, foreign body, or dentures. You don't perform immediately. You check first, okay? You don't perform CPR because they have a pulse. You should place a patient in a recovery position when? When, why, how? Allow secretion to drain out of the mouth. Last question, pulse oximetry is used to assess the amount of oxygen saturated in the red blood cells. I think that's the correct one. Let's read it, read it for yourself. Pulse ox, does it eliminate carbon dioxide? No, it doesn't. It's not oxygen. Assess how much oxygen the patient requires? No, it doesn't tell you what it needs. It just tells you how much oxygen is in the red blood cell. Your physical assessment, what you see, determines how much oxygen you give to the patient. Provide supplemental oxygen to the patient. Again, pulse ox, just check. It doesn't give oxygen to the patient. All right? So there you have it. Again, review for yourself. Read the, read, read the chapter. Do the homework. Assessment in action. Okay? And hand it in. So thank you for your... For viewing this, any questions, definitely feel free to contact one of the instructors.